Welcome to our sharing on the book of Genesis. And we are coming to the end of chapter 9 in this episode. And I want to deal with Noah and his sons, his three sons. And I begin at verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out from the ark were Shem, Ham and Japheth. And then we go on to talk about one of their sons. So first of all, the earth was to be repopulated to these three men and their wives, naturally, but they only name the, the, the male leaders. So if you take uh, the country that we call Israel today and was called the land of Canaan in those days, if you take that uh, representing this section here, then Japheth was sent up north to people at the whole area that in later times was called Europe. And Ham was sent south to the area that, generally speaking, we call Africa. And it involves a massive number of countries. And then Shem was the one to uh, people the area that we call the, the Bible lands. Okay, And so that's Israel and the lands east of it as well. That's just a very general thing, but just to realize that Japhet went north. And you're going to hear something interesting about Japheth if I tell you that he went north towards Europe. Shem is in the biblical area and Ham is in the, the, the south. Okay, it didn't happen overnight, of course. And then you're told that the, the son of Ham was called Canaan and this land was called after him. It's very interesting if you connect this with later events uh, in Exodus and Numbers and Joshua, for example, and the whole earth was to be populated through them. And then immediately it goes into a completely different thing, which is actually quite a shock. And it is Noah's fall from grace. He starts so high. He's in the grace of the Lord. He's obedient to the Lord. He does exactly everything that the Lord uh, tells him to do. Now they're back on terra firma and we get back to normal. So what we're told then from verse 20, that he began to be a farmer. In other words, they began to cultivate the earth. And the first thing you hear of is a vineyard. Okay. And of course, therefore, it produces the wine. And next thing you're told that uh, Noah drank the wine and became drunk. And there's an expression that you need to understand. And that is, he became uncovered in his tent. Now, to uncover nakedness, which is the expression used all over the Pentateuch, uh, is a, an indication of sexual sin. Now, whether it is with somebody else or not, it's not indicated. It's just simply that it was sexual sin to uncover the nakedness. Okay. And then you're told Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth, out of uh, deep respect for their father, uh, carried a cloak between them and covered the nakedness. Now, it's given all in as if it was a physical story, but there, there's something much, much deeper uh, to it. And that is that, you know, restarting the earth and restarting the human race, everything seemed idyllic, just as it was in the Garden of Eden. It was absolutely idyllic for Adam and Eve. How could anything go wrong? So the, the scriptures absolutely must give you the truth. And that is that Noah and his sons are not perfect. They are the children of a fallen race. They've got original sin in them. They've got concupiscence. They've got all the problems that all their descendants have to actually deal with. And so the problems manifest immediately. They are not redeemed people. Redemption is a long way off. And so we're back to the sinfulness and the, the weakness of the human race. Now, nakedness in the Bible is a very important word, and I gave it to you before. Clothing means the clothing of grace. It's not just physical clothing on your body, but it's the, the garment of grace. So nakedness means you've done something that the garment of grace is removed. So we call that sin. And in this case, uh, it seems to be sexual sin uh, because intemperance and impurity seem to go together. Okay, so you look at them 
at Noah in this condition and you just say how the mighty have fallen. And it's exactly the same as with Adam, how the mighty have fallen. How could they fall from such a height? Uh, and it makes you ask as well, will human beings ever learn? Because this is back in antiquity. Here we are 2000 years after redemption and has the human race learned anything? Have we not fallen back into the same problems? And that is the, the tragedy of the human race is that it fails God under every circumstance that God actually gives them. So what I want to do is give you a, a comparison between Adam and Noah. But before that, I just want to give you Noah's reaction to his son, Ham, who uh, did not respond uh, correctly uh, to his father's problem. So we're told in verse 24 that Noah awoke from his wine and realized that his younger son, whatever he had done, thank God they didn't tell us because we'd be writing books about it. And then he said, cursed be Canaan. Now, he didn't say Ham himself, who was the, the ancestor of all these peoples in the South, that he would be cursed, because that would curse the whole lot of them. He didn't do that, and they understood that a curse was a very powerful thing. So he chose one of the children of Ham to carry the curse of his father, and that was Canaan. Now, we will be dealing with a land called the land of Canaan, and we will be dealing with the Canaanites and all the rest of it. And it's really sad. It's really sad. A servant of servants he will be. Uh, he will be towards his brethren. And then he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, because it's from Shem that the chosen people are going to come. And may Canaan be his servant. Uh, there's a prophecy that will be fulfilled in the book of Numbers and Joshua, particularly when uh, the land of Canaan is actually uh, conquered by the children of Shem. And then verse 27 is considered to be a prophecy about the Gentiles because Japheth goes up towards Europe. And may God enlarge Japheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, if he's going towards Europe, and Shem is down here. They're going to be living in vastly different areas. How could Japheth live in the tents of Shem? It's only when you come to the New Testament and you realize that the body of Christ, the, the ones who believe in the Redeemer, actually are grafted onto the vine. And so they become part of the people of God. So he will dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. Okay. And we're told that Noah lived 350 years after the flood. So he had plenty of time uh, to repent also. So now I want to give you a comparison between uh, Adam and Noah. And you'll be surprised. There's so much likeness between them. Let's take the first one. Adam was uh, made Lord of the earth by God. And in chapter 9 and verse 2, Noah was declared Lord of the earth by God. Uh, secondly, Adam was blessed by God and he was told to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. And so Noah was told that in chapter 9, verse 1. Adam was placed in a garden to cultivate it. And in chapter 9, verse 20, uh, Noah is put back on the earth and told that he is to cultivate and take care of the earth. The fourth point is that Adam sinned in that garden and we find, uh, as I've just uh, related to you, that Noah sinned in the area he was cultivating as well in his vineyard. The fifth point that Adam became naked, that means he lost the garment of grace and I've just related to you in 9.21 that uh, Noah lost the garment of grace as well. After Adam's fall, we're told that his nakedness was covered, or I, I explained at the time that that covering meant atonement, that God covered him because this sin was going to have to be atoned for. And in chapter 9, verses 23 to 25, we find two of Noah's sons doing that covering. Okay, so whether they made atonement for their father or not, it's not explicitly said in the text. 
The seventh point I want to make is that uh, sin brought a curse to the posterity of Adam. Everybody carries this original sin and the concupiscence and everything that goes with it. And that curse uh, of Noah's was passed on to Canaan and his descendants as well, which is really sad. The next point is that Adam, we are told, had three sons, Cain, Abel and Seth. That doesn't mean he had no other. In those days, uh, people had an enormous number of children because they were trying to populate the earth and also because of infant mortality and all kinds of stuff. Uh, there would be lots of children. The Bible uh, simply speaks of three. They are Cain, Abel and Seth. And out of all of the uh, children brought into the world by Noah who are not named, only three are named. That's uh, Shem, Ham and Japheth. The ninth point I want to make is that the promised seed of the woman was to come through the line of Seth. And the promised seed of the woman was now going to come through the line of Shem. And so there's a prophecy about the, the future redemption uh, given to Adam uh, in Genesis 3.15. And I've just read for you the prophecy of Noah about the future of his sons as well. Look how close it actually is. It's amazing. And we see that God is prepared to start all over again. Now, if Noah, we're told, lived for 350 years after the flood, that means that he lived 950 years altogether. Now, Adam only lived 930 years, which is absolutely amazing. My reaction to the text up to now. I don't know what yours is, but I want to stimulate a reaction in you. My reaction is that I feel very sorry for God. God pours out his love, he pours out his grace, he pours out absolutely everything. He gives every opportunity to the human race to live at the highest level of its being. And the humans turn around and no matter what he does, they manage to fail him gloriously. It's absolutely incredible. So I marvel at God's absolutely incredible patience, his infinite patience, which tells us, of course, that he is divine. So now I want to go into chapter 10, and I'm absolutely certain that chapter 10 is not your favourite reading, because it's an entire list of names, all the children of uh, Shem, and where they go in the Middle East, and Japheth, and where they go in the north, and Ham, and where they go in the south. So. Out of all of that list, I want to just pick up one or two names that are going to be of interest to us. Okay, so if we go to the sons of Ham, the ones who are going south, then I want to name one of them. This is in chapter 10, verse 6, and his name is Cush. Cush becomes the father of Nimrod. Now, Nimrod is a very important character. The, the book of Genesis gives very little attention to him. But if you go into the ancient book of Jasher, you will learn an awful lot about uh, Nimrod, which will throw light on the whole story of Abraham and all the rest of it. Because uh, Nimrod, we are told, let me read it for you. Uh, the sons of Ham were Cush Mizraim, which is a name that was given to Egypt afterwards, Push and Canaan. The sons of Cush were Seba, Havilah, Rama, and so on. Verse 8, Cush begot Nimrod. He began to be a mighty one upon the earth. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore it is said, like Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord. Now, that's a very simple, quick summary of a massive thing that happened at this particular time. And we'll come to uh, talk more about Nimrod in the next chapter, in chapter 11, because I, I want to point out to you the, the language that's used here. He began to be mighty. That means he didn't start off mighty. So there's some kind of an invasion of evil coming into him because this man turns out to be the very first tyrant of the Bible. 
Uh, he's the very first anti-God figure in the Bible, and he becomes the, uh, the type that points all the way down to the book of Revelation, to the Antichrist. And so to understand the Antichrist, you have to actually come back to Nimrod. So it's amazing that the, the book of Genesis uh, pays so little attention uh, to the, the goings on of uh, Nimrod. Maybe they didn't realize that there would be a definitive uh, version of this back down in the book of Revelation. So Canaan, the, the one that Noah cursed, gave rise to the Jebusites. And the Jebusites lived in an area that we call Jerusalem. The Amorites and the Hevites, they became the dwellers of the land that became known as the land of Canaan. Okay. And so we're going to find when we get into chapter 12 that this is the land that God actually donated to Abraham and his children. This specific land. So whatever that curse was, it was something uh, actually vibrant. Uh, when we come into chapter 11, I will be telling you, of course, that Abraham was actually born into the empire of Nimrod. So all of this is connected in a very big way. Okay, so let's come to uh, chapter 11. And here we deal with what we call the Tower of Babel. And I'll read a few verses for you first. Now, the whole earth had one language and one speech. What do you mean by the whole earth? These people are living in the area where Noah actually landed uh, after the flood and they begin to move out from there. Initially, they don't move anywhere. Now, God told them they were to repeople the earth, but initially they don't. They actually stay in one particular area. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain. Okay, there's mountains, plain. And that plain is actually very interesting. In the land of Shinar. Now, here you've got Israel, okay, and go to the east where the Tigris and the Euphrates are, down to Ur of the Chaldees in southern Iraq. That's the area of Shinar. And that was where the very first uh, civilization of the human race is known to have been, if we're talking about biblical lands. We're not talking about China and all of these other places. We're just talking about the, the biblical lands because the Garden of Eden was between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Well, Ur of the Chaldees is down there and that's where Abraham is going to be born. That's the area that Nimrod is actually conquering. By brute force, he conquered it. And it seems that Nimrod might have been one of those Nephilim. But because the expression was that he began to be, he may not have been that in the beginning, and so it might have been some kind of evil infestation in him because he became a very evil person. So they went to the land of Shinar, but they went to a plain, which if you have a mountain, the plain is the lowest point. I'm emphasizing that for a particular reason. And they said to one another, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. Uh, so they had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. Asphalt was what was used to make something watertight. Okay, that's very interesting. We have to look into that. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in heaven. Well, if you want to build a, a tower whose top is in heaven, you don't begin at the lowest level. Wouldn't you think you'd go up the mountain and start building it from there? So if they want a tower that reaches the heavens, they're actually building in the wrong place or else we're reading it wrong. Or else they're saying something different to what we think they're saying. Okay? I'm just alerting you now to interpretation. So we'll build a tower whose top is in the heavens let us make a name for ourselves. Mm. These people no longer want to give glory to God. They want to give glory to themselves. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad on the face of the earth. 
Do you not find that interesting? God told Noah, increase, multiply, fill the earth. And what are they saying? No, we're not going anywhere. We're staying here. Absolute rebellion against God is what we're actually looking at here. And so the Lord came down to see uh, the city and the tower of which the sons of men had built. Now, of course, God doesn't need to do that. But the person who is actually giving the story to us wants us to get into the drama of it. That means, you know, somebody has to come and see what's going on. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is only the beginning. In other words, God can see where this will go. This is only the beginning. Nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them now. And you have to say to yourself, what precisely is it that God says would enable them to succeed in what they were setting out to do? And it's the word unity. They were one, one people, one language, one purpose, one motivation, all united in rebellion. That was the problem. Okay, we have to look into that. God has to intervene. He doesn't want another disaster on the earth. It's too soon after the flood. How could they get into such rebellion so soon? Uh, the shock of chapter 11 is that the human race has descended so far so soon. That's why you look at Nimrod and he began to be a mighty one. So has the infiltration happened again? If, you, if we go back, we were told uh, in chapter 6 that in those days the Nephilim were upon the earth and they returned. Okay, so God has to do something because he, he has promised not to destroy the earth again. Uh, he has uh, given them the sign of hope in the rainbow. So he has to do something to get the human race to obey him. And he does something that only God would think of, and that is put them in a position where they don't understand each other. Scatter them. They can't hear what the other is saying. They don't understand each other's language. And if they don't understand each other's language, they will move off in groups who do understand one another. And so God gets them to scatter over the earth against their will. But they are no longer doing his will. In verse 7, God says, Come, let us go down. Notice the us. Uh, these early chapters of the book of Genesis keep on hinting at the plurality of persons in God. The name given that is translated in English as God is actually a plural name, Elohim. And it's only uh, at a later point that they begin to uh, name the different uh, persons in God, although you got it in chapter one, there was God, there was the Spirit of God, and there was the Word of God. We're going to meet this again in chapter 18, when three personages come to Abraham at the Oak of Mamre, and one of them, Abraham, calls my Lord. The other two are angels who uh, go to carry out his bidding uh, in Sodom and Gomorrah. So come, let us go down and confuse their language that they may not understand each other's speech so that therefore they can't continue working together, can they? So the Lord scattered them abroad. He's the one who scattered them all over the earth. He scattered them from there all over the face of the earth and they ceased building the city. Therefore, the name is called we call it in English Babel or Babel, and it came to be understood as confusion. Now, spiritually, that's going to be very important, and I'll try and point that out to you. Uh, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the earth. So the Lord has to actually get these people to do his will in spite of all of their sinfulness. It's, it's really uh, amazing. Let's look at this. 
So after the, the flood, we have uh, the descendants of Noah and they have to uh, actually try and obey the will of God. And we find uh, here in chapter 11 how quickly they actually descend from that particular position. Okay, I call this the next rebellion or the post-flood crisis. And you say, it's like a person uh, who is ill and they, they sort of improve and then all of a sudden they become ill again. That's what you're looking at spiritually in the human race here, that we go back to a, a previous position, okay? So when you come to the Tower of Babel, you have to say time has passed. It didn't happen instantly because all of these people had to be born and they had to develop, they had to uh, spread and all the rest of it. We're not told uh, just exactly when it was, but it seems to have been approximately 320 years after the flood. It seems to be. And when they uh, decide that they're not going to obey God, they're going to do things their own way. So Noah is supposed to be the Lord of the earth, but since he fell from grace, nobody's following him. And I want you to notice that Noah just simply disappears off the pages of the book. Just like Adam, he went into absolute obscurity. And when the leader failed, then you have all the people doing what they want. The, the strong leadership is actually very important. So here in chapter 11, you have them all congregating in one place. Now, why do they congregate in one place? They want security. This is one of the problems of the human race. We'll do anything to feel secure. And the second thing is absolutely in the human race everywhere as well. They want to be famous. They want to be remembered forever. They don't want to just come and live and die and disappear. They want to be remembered forever. So they begin to build a, a city and a tower and they build it in such a way as to make it waterproof. Now, why are they making it waterproof? Does that mean they do not accept God's promise that he said he would never flood them again? They are going to say, we are going to be safe this time. That when the, when the floods come, that we will actually survive because we know how to build a city that will be waterproof and a tower. And if the tower is very high, of course, we will survive because we can be at the top. It's incredible. The thinking is completely opposite to what God actually wants. And we know, of course, that what they actually built was a ziggurat. And there's plenty of examples of ziggurats on the, the internet. And I won't go into the fact that there were ziggurats in different parts of the earth as well, because after all, the whole earth was being peopled, okay? And a ziggurat has a very high steps and it has at least one very high platform. And today the scholars don't really know what was the purpose of the very high platform, uh, whether it was an observation of the stars or whatever it was, okay? They're not, they're not sure at all but the ziggurats are in different parts of the earth. Okay. But it means that they are doing their own thing. They're going to build a man-made kingdom. It's going to be run by man. It's going to be done in man's ways. So there's the absolute rejection of God's kingdom and God's ways. Here you have them all choosing the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the archaeologists have discovered that this type of kiln-fired brick and asphalt construction was very common all over the area in Babylon. It was just in this particular place, all over the area. So uh, this is the time of Nimrod, and he is the mighty hunter who has dominated and has become king. And I put king in inverted commas because they never use the term for him although he was the one actually running the whole thing. And uh, it, it is Nimrod that turned them all away from God and away from God's will to concentrate on themselves 
and to assert themselves and to make themselves great. So the focus is no longer God and heaven. The focus is on power, prestige, success and wealth. Don't you remember Cain? This is the way of Cain. Don't you remember the Nephilim? In chapter 6, this is the way of the Nephilim. And so there is a question as to whether this uh, Nimrod became one of the Nephilim or was one of them, okay? Because when you look at depictions of Nimrod uh, on the internet, for example, you'll find that he is uh, given as a giant figure. Now, he was a giant in many ways, that uh, he was a giant in power, in domination. Uh, he was an absolute tyrant. Uh, he was a giant over men. But what you find from chapter 6 is that the actual physical giants uh, were the ones who dominated everybody else. Nobody could, could uh, oppose them because of their sheer size. Uh, and so the mighty hunter uh, indicates this. So the amazing thing is that if you uh, look into uh, occult practices uh, today and all down the centuries, that m most astrological and occult practices claim history going back to Babel. In other words, there's something about that ziggurat uh, that speaks to them. So uh, this tower was built on the plain of Shinar. Now, the plain of Shinar was actually at sea level. It was utterly crazy if they physically wanted to reach the heavens. But it isn't that. It's not that. If they physically wanted to reach the heavens, then they would try building on a mountain. Now, in later times, when you go into uh, the other books of the Bible, you will find that people, in fact, build their shrines on hills. They call them high places, okay? And so that's some kind of a, an imitation of what's going on here, okay? So uh, the tower was real. It's not a fiction story. And ziggurats, as I said, have been found in various places around the earth. The problem is Nimrod. And we're told in chapter 10 and verse 9, that Nimrod was a mighty hunter before the Lord, the first to be included in his empire were Babel, Erech, Achad, all in the south of uh, Babylon, around the Tigris and the Euphrates, not very far from the area that was called Eden in the early days. So if this is happening in the area that was called Eden, then Eden is called paradise when human beings are living in union with God. And here it's hell on earth under this tyrant uh, Nimrod. So the human race has descended terribly. Uh, my way of, of describing uh, Genesis uh, 3 to 11 is that sin increased and multiplied and filled the earth and conquered it. And of course, sin gives Satan a massive foothold, okay? I want you to note that Cain was also described as a mighty hunter. Ishmael will be described as a mighty hunter. And Esau, after him, will also be described as a mighty hunter, okay? And therefore, these mighty hunters are in the image of the Nephilim, even if they are not Nephilim themselves. They are like them mighty men dominating, uh, killing and rampaging and conquering others. If you read the book of Jasher, you will also find that Esau is the one who actually kills Nimrod. Okay, so the location of this place is called Shinar. That's early days. It was the area of the very first civilization of Sumer. And later history called this initially Babylonia, and later Babylon. So Babylon becomes uh, a very important word in the Bible and it goes right through to the book of Revelation where we are, we have the Antichrist and Mystery Babylon. Now, Mystery Babylon has to do with the fact that what you're reading here isn't just something that's going on on the outside, it's 
something that's going on on the inside of the human race. It's this frightful struggle between the seed of the woman and Satan and, and his absolute opposition to anything that God wants to do. So he will uh, do anything to bring the human race down. Okay, so because Nimrod, through his sheer force and power, conquered all of these places, when we go on into the story of Abraham, we'll see more of what he actually conquered. Because of that, he appoints himself Lord of the earth. That's why he's never called a king. Now, it was God who appointed Adam Lord of the earth. It was God who appointed Noah Lord of the earth. Now you have somebody deciding, I can do it by myself. I don't need any God. The strength is in me. And so you're seeing a human being uh, building themselves up in the image of Satan. I will not serve. I will rule. I want to be God. And insofar as he could be God uh, among human beings, uh, Nimrod succeeded in that. So what was given by grace to Adam and to Noah is now taken by force and violence by Nimrod. So what does Nimrod do? He begins the kingdom of man in opposition to the kingdom of God. He is ruling outside of God's will. He's ruling in independence of God, which is called pride. That is exactly what Satan wanted. That's why I said he's either one of the Nephilim or he's built himself up in the image of the Nephilim. So he has made the absolute wrong choice. And so God has to intervene to stop the human race from being completely destroyed. It's really sad. So the sign that Satan is around is pride, arrogance, dominance, violence. When these become the way, and we're going to meet the same problem now when we come to Sodom and Gomorrah later as well. Because these, these are called the deadly sins because they bring the human race into absolute opposition uh, to God and his kingdom. And they utterly frustrate a human being's ability to actually reach their destiny in heaven. That's why they're called deadly or mortal sins. Okay. And so, to sum up the whole thing up, the unseen one, the unseen enemy, is Satan. Now using Nimrod to set up the kingdom of man on earth, but in whose image? in the image of Satan. Because pride, arrogance, lust, violence, and all the rest of it, that's all in the image of Satan. And so it's Satan literally kicking up the heel against God. Kicking up the heel is a, a, a biblical expression for absolute despising another person. And so Satan is saying, I've won again. You, you try it again through Noah. I've brought them down even faster than the last time. It didn't take so long. Okay, so the cosmic battle that's going on between Satan and God continues, okay? And so it, out of God's sheer love for humanity, he has to intervene. And the most marvelous way to intervene was to scatter them. That's all, just simply to scatter them. So Nimrod began something that you will hear even to this very day, and that is might is right. Okay, so he became the first evil emperor, world conqueror, and he points to the last one, which is the Antichrist, uh, which is still coming. He was anti-God, just as the Antichrist is anti-Christ, and, and both block God's plans massively uh, to prevent God's kingdom to come on the earth. So the anti-God figure Nimrod, the Antichrist figure, they worship themselves and they exalt themselves instead of worshiping God and exalting God. Okay, so this is a massive uh, attack on the seed of the woman. And Satan shows that he's absolutely determined that God will not have his way. So here we are in this great drama 
of history, which is being played out in the ancient world and is still being played out today under our very noses, if only we could see. Thank you for listening. Sloan August Bannock, they live. Goodbye. God bless you. I want to give you a little message from me, and that is that the Word of God is the second great food that God has given to us. The first one is the Eucharist. The second one, the manna from heaven, is the Word of God. And the third one is prayer. But in order to give people the Word of God, a lot of people have to do an enormous amount of work. They have to go into a great deal of research and do a lot of homework. You mightn't realize it. Jesus told his apostles that the laborer was worthy of his hire. And in other words, that they were to feed the people spiritually, but that the people should enable the apostles to be able to do the work. So I want to make a little uh, plea for you on behalf of Shalom World TV to ask you that if the Word of God is really feeding you, if it's giving you life, if it really is what God wanted it to be, and we're trying very hard to do that, that you would respond by enabling them to be able to continue giving you this. Your donation would actually give life to others and enable them to work. And the Lord would reward you and we would be very grateful. Thank you. worries, sadness. Are you seeking solutions? Bible says, do not be anxious about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Choose faith over fear.